All right, well, we're going to jump into a little bit of a conversation here in a minute, Ben. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where you been? What do you do now? Yeah. So first of all, super thrilled to, to chat with you. following everything you put out for for years and i think a lot of the go-to-market community looks up to you as i want his career i i i I think fondly of everything that you've built and so yeah i started my career you know when i was in college i was lucky enough to get an sdr job at siebel which dates me a little bit because they stopped being a company in 05 and i was like a full-time sdr monday through thursday that had 13 units on a friday so i was like in college but had a real job and i was like i love this job like i was you know, into sales, into the idea of sales, but you just got so much good training. I ended up at Oracle for four years, ended up being a global account manager there, could see cloud coming from a mile away. So I moved to Google, was there for about five years, including two and a half in Singapore. Then I did a startup and then I found myself looking at the sort of landscape of companies out there and being like, wait, no one's really using data to do go to market, but there's this explosion of raw data out there. I'm going to start an advisory firm that helps companies think about that. So I ran a company called Dogpatch for about six years. And then Henry, the CEO of ZoomInfo, reached out to me one day. He's like, hey, I love what you're doing. I want you to do everything you're doing there, but just do it here. And you can come work here. And I'm like, okay. You know, at first I was a little skeptical, but it turns out uh, it was a perfect fit for me. So I joined and I run something called ZoomInfo Labs now, which is go-to-market innovation and strategic services for our largest customers. And I feel like I have the best job in the world. I feel really lucky. That's amazing. How long have you been at ZoomInfo now? Almost two years. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So from a startup to a little advisory to a huge publicly traded company. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think that inside of this publicly traded company, we have our own little startup. So there's lots of, I think, things that we're able to move fast and do you know a lot like that feeling of a startup inside of a yeah. company, which always is a dream. It doesn't always happen. But Henry really leans into the idea of disruption and you know moving fast. And so I, I think I get a little bit of the best of both worlds. That's not at all surprising to hear. Henry is the man. He's just like such a great thinker. He's always ahead of the curve. So talk to us a little bit about ZoomInfo Labs, ZI Labs. What's the charter? What's the mission? What are you doing for customers? Yeah, great question. So I think of it as the sort of flywheel between what we innovate on internally and what our best customers are doing. So there's many cases where what Zoom Info is doing from a go to market perspective is world class. Yep. And we should spin that out to our 35,000 customers, right? Similarly, there's a lot of things that are happening within some of the best companies in the world, right? A lot of the biggest you know, companies in B2B are Zoom Info customers. And what they're doing is often really interesting and not, you know, it's not a secret, it's just hard. And so often we're trying to figure out what those things are that we can either learn from and weave back into our business or help bring to other customers. So I really want to sort of be that flywheel between internal and external. That sort of ends up being both project-based things that we run internally and with partners and you know, OpenAI and Anthropic and a bunch of partnerships there, but also strategic services. So companies will have us come in and say, hey, I want you to go and help me nail targeting or ICP or personas you know, at a enterprise level scale, we'll actually do those as professional services. So it's, it's a little bit of everything, but think of it as go-to-market innovation for the, for, for the whole industry. I love that, Ben. Absolutely love that. And there are so many different threads we could pull on CI Labs and the way that you're consulting. But what I want to focus on today is really AI. You just yeah. mentioned OpenAI, you mentioned Anthropic. So how does AI fit in to CI Labs? How are you thinking about helping go-to-market teams leverage AI? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, one, one thing that we did is we launched sort of like an AI practice as part of our earnings call six months ago. And the idea was to sort of like add to a lot of the themes we're already helping companies with to also help companies think about AI readiness, right? How is the data layer? How do they think about tools, platforms, you know, use cases? And then how do we weave it into everything we do? You know, I think you're closer to this world than anyone, you know, but to me, it is, it is not, oh, do we need AI for, for this thing? It's how are we going to change everything we do yes. because of AI in yes. this? You know, I think most people I've found in, in, in our world, but even like people who are really close to it, still haven't like really seen that it's not just rewriting a blog post into a different voice. Like it can yeah. clearly do that, you know, data processing, image processing, using voice. I mean, we're having conversations with our CRM 
that in these GPT bots that you just literally didn't even think about anything like that. So I think of it as weaving AI into everything that we do. A big part of what I'm doing every day is helping companies think about how do you reimagine the data layer that's powering everything from ICP, mm -hmm. personas, segmentation, content pivots, and reorient that data layer so that it's ready to plug into AI and that you've got to go out there and probably take two or three steps back and rebuild all the frameworks for how you're coaching AI to do the right things with your data. It's not such like a simple thing of one data point mapped into a field anymore. It's one data point that can be extrapolated out in all these completely new ways. Yeah. So one of the things that I tell my team is ask not what the AI can do for you, but what can you do for your AI? Like you need to feed it the frameworks and teach it and help it to better understand what you want. And sometimes that's really rigorous. Like you might actually spend yeah. hours building out the framework just to teach it one thing that then it will do, you know, into perpetuity. I, I have been teaching with you, if AI, is new, not, if AI is not doing what you want, it's your fault. Go fix it. It's not, it's not on them. That's such an, it's such an interesting mindset, Ben, because we think about this and we do this all the time for people. We spend three, six, nine, 12 months onboarding, training, continuing, like pouring all these resources into one SDR so that they can go and craft a good solid, you know, cold email or make a good cold call or objection handler or something like that. But when it comes to training a model, people are like, ah, I don't know. I don't want to take the time. Right. It's a waste of time. Do you, is that the objection that you're hearing from folks? Yeah. I mean, in many cases, I think that, you know, folks haven't gotten over the initial sort of, I would call it like, you've got to put in your 50 to 100 hours of just seeing what does this mode mean? Like, how do you actually think about your prompts as if it's a new language you're learning, right? Yeah. So I, a lot of folks just haven't gone through the hard part of, oh, it can, it can do that if you get to this certain you know set of things. I think the other the other thing that I'm really you know really focused on is how much it can impact the ability to test and iterate, right? Like a lot of the reason why most companies don't actually run a very expansive playbook, you know, like why don't they have 10, 20, 30 always on plays? A lot of it comes back to content generation. And I'd love to hear from you your thoughts on what you're seeing in copy that AI so far. But a lot of it is just like you hit a local maximum of, oh, I'm running four or five plays. I have my intent play, my inbound play, my champions move play, and my new CMO hired play. I'm sure you're getting a lot of that play these days. And, you know, I sort of run out of capacity to do stuff. Like yeah. I need to execute all these plays. I can't actually stand up a new touch cadence. I can't test seven different variants of that cadence. That's the first place that we're finding the outflow for this is like your ability to iterate and test is almost infinite. And I have examples of stuff we've done for big companies that we can talk through, but that's the first place I'm encouraging folks to go. I think that's exactly right. And we see a very similar thing on the marketing side. I'm sure you're seeing it as well, where in a past life or even the, the current life for most companies, if you're, let's just say, running a digital ad campaign, you have a new, new campaign, new product, whatever it is you're going to market with some sort of messaging that more often than not is just one bozo's opinion about right. what may or may not be the right way to position this thing. And you just launch the campaign, cross your fingers and, and hope. But that's obviously suboptimal. Like, why not if AI can write and rewrite positioning and headlines in two seconds and you have 15 different ads that you can go run, send them, serve yeah. those ads, 100%. see what actually gets the right engagement and then inform your sales collateral, your pitch decks, your call scripts, everything with that messaging that's already been vetted. I can't totally. tell you how many times, Ben, like I've rolled out a new pitch deck or a new sales asset to the field or something like that, been super proud of myself. And then five days later, the field comes back and they're like, yeah, we're not going to use that. That's, that's garbage. I'm like, Sh shoot. And yeah. so hopefully AI can help speed up that learning curve and make sure that the, the messaging is validated. Totally. And everyone can maybe gets the version that they want. You know, right. Everybody's sort of like, has a different sense of what good is, right? I think that's that has come up a lot with AI of, oh, I don't like that. That's not good. You know, art, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? And I think right. that your point, it's a very different version of the ad that's going to play in SMB versus enterprise, in this market versus that market, you know, with this tech stack versus that. And so instead of having to try to find the line of best fit, just have them all, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it reminds me of something. I think it was in the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss book from way back when, where he was like, instead of launching a new product, 
I'm going to create ads and fake websites for five different products and see what the market wants. And then I'll go create the product. And it was like such an interesting sort of backwards way of thinking about it. But the learning curve. One other thing I want to add there, if I could, is that I feel like there's also a lot of work that has already been done that you can then use as a jumping off point to get to all those. So one that I'll I'll like just mention an example. We're working with a very large SaaS company that we've all heard of and, and used that had 400 case studies on their website. But when their outbound team was trying to get vertical specific snippets in and use social proof to say, hey, we already work with company A and company B to do X, they were literally pasting it in from a spreadsheet. I'm like, your marketing team has 400 case studies. Those case studies all have company names and metrics and industries and things attached to them. So what we did is, and I can show this if it's helpful, is we took all the case studies and then we had AI first summarize, like what is the nature of this case study? What's the tone? What's the length? Pull out the metrics, right? It can do all this parsing, which people don't think of as part of AI's capability set. Then we said, okay, now come up with the 150 character version, 100 character version, like the SDR voice, the curious voice, the CEO's voice, the aggressive voice, the funny voice. Like you just start extrapolating out from this, it's almost like your existing work is a launching point for all of these different things that you can pull out of it. And I, I just think most people haven't conceptualized that that's even possible yet. They sort of think of it as, I can either have a chat with it or my engineer uses the API, but there's so right. much in between, right? 100%. And, and it's so interesting because a couple of things you've already mentioned here, Ben, I think are the main blockers, which one is the learning curve. There is a, a bit of a learning curve and you need to spend time, just like staring at a blank Excel page it's not going to be valuable unless you learn how to actually use Excel. Kind of the same thing is true with AI in many cases. So learning curve is one. The second is the art of the possible. Why should I even take the 50 hours, the 100 hours to go and learn when I have no idea what it can do for me? So how do we resolve this chicken and egg situation? How do you show people what's possible and prove to them that it's worth investing their time in? Yeah. First of all, it's the question of the day, right? Like, how do I get started? I think that's one is we need to do more stuff like this, not just me and you, but I think folks who are out there on the frontier should be sharing it and talking about you know, what they're doing. To me, I think that you want to make sure that you have a really well-articulated hypothesis for where a huge amount of time is being spent yes. that can be you know, replaced with, with AI. I think the other thing that, that people really need to, to think about is I think so far, it has been like the generative part that people think of first. I actually don't like using the term generative AI. I think it's like saying mobile phone. It's just a phone, right? You know, it's not, we don't need to differentiate anymore. I, I don't know if you all would, would agree with that. But as an example of, of something that most people aren't thinking about, is like you can take a picture of a product page on someone's website, upload that into ChatGPT, ask it to parse it, and then upload a spreadsheet and say, hey, how would my intent topics map to this particular set of products? I found myself like audibly yelping when that first worked. Now it doesn't work every time. There's always latency issues. It's not as consistent as you might want, whatever. But, you know, the average ops team, I think sort of goes with like the latest thing they heard or the going wisdom on what their intent topics should be, et cetera. Take all your customer data, Upload descriptions and industries and all the core attributes. Upload a set of intent topics and watch what it can do to help match different data sets. So again, that's just an area that people were spending a huge amount of time before. I would, if I was the average sort of like CRO, you know, ops leader, et cetera, I would go and catalog like, where is all the time being spent? What are the data sets underneath? What is the sort of jobs to be done within those data sets? And How can we sort of prioritize out? Okay, this is like a straight down the middle use case. It's obvious. This one's going to take a few hops, but it's worth building out that infrastructure to get there. So yeah, oh, there's so much, so much to talk about. That framework, Ben, that you just gave is like super useful. Thinking about, and, and oftentimes what's so interesting about it is people want to use AI for the really glamorous, like super cool use case. And it's like really niche and cool, but you know, did we really, was it necessary? Where the less glamorous, like infrastructure oriented jobs to be done is kind of where more of the, most of the value is. Like it takes an SDR or an AE an hour or two hours to put together an account plan. How can we have AI and train AI to go put together that account plan 
Like you totally. said, train the model once so that it exists in perpetuity. And totally. if you can if you can identify things like that that are huge time sucks that you can go, like you said, I'm going to rate it out loud or say it out loud again, catalog where the time is being spent. Think really deeply about the data sets underneath that and then train the model on the jobs to be done against that data. Like that one, two, three is, is exactly the right guidance. So my question for you is... Let's focus on go-to-market teams, focus on sales teams in particular. What use cases do you think are the biggest time sucks that can or should be helped or automated with AI today? Yeah, great great question. So I think first and foremost, I don't want to at all take away from like content creation, content variation, content rewrite. It's incredibly good at that. It's better than your best writer. It should be the first place that you go. The first thing that we did when AI really started to like actually work in production and was available to everyone. And when GPT-4 came out, it was really like, I think the moment yeah. was we said, there's nothing stopping us from creating every touch of every play for every company. So the first thing that, that I think, you know, companies should do is look at how many plays are you running? How many should you be running? And is the gap between those two because you don't have actually time to create all the content? In most cases, in many cases, that's exactly the problem. It's, it's just like, too hard to conceptualize like, what the trigger is. How does that trigger inform segmentation, content pivots, all the things, right? Yep. So that was the first thing that I think I recommend to every company is like, get to every version of every play, even every voice within every version of every play. That's all just possible now. I think you said the second one to, to me is account planning. If you think about the nature of account planning, it's basically combining third-party data, like from Zoom Info or our competitors or whoever, First party data, all the stuff you know about them from your CRM, product usage data, et cetera. Structured, you know, data, but also unstructured data, like job postings yep. that, from that company, their website content, you know, their most recent earnings transcript. Like putting all those things together and saying, here are the, here's the box I want you to operate in for this account plan. Help me build this account plan. It's there today. You don't have to, you know, you could you could do it with copy.ai, you can do it with a bunch of different tools, that's possible today. And if you think about, you know, that process for the average rep, they're just doing that exact same thing. They go look and see around, like, who do we talk to? What do we know about them? What are they doing with the product today? Okay, now they go out to Zoom Info or wherever and say, okay, what do I know about them? What technographics? Now, what does this company do? What are they interested in? What are their priorities? Like, they're going through that exact same process. So just replicate what the humans are doing and do it at scale for every account. So I think account planning is number two. The other thing I think a huge amount of time is spent on QBRs and sort of reporting out. I have found that, you know, reps hate having to prep the deck for their QBR. They don't mind actually doing the QBR. Yeah, definitely. And they don't mind the insights that they get from their sales team after they do it, but they hate actually building out all the content. It's really good for, here's my book of business. Here's how I did. Help me establish a narrative, stuff it in this deck, right? You know, a lot of like hops in between. There's like work to be done. It's not just like a free work stream. But those three, I think is like playbook expansion, account planning, and then, you know, some regular report out on what's actually working, not working, et cetera. Great stuff, Ben. So on the on all three of these and many more AI use cases, I'm sure we could talk through a little devil's advocate perspective for you here. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, the time that the seller is spending doing the research, doing the prep work, writing the emails, that's time well spent. They're learning. They're contextualizing. They're not just parroting something that a robot tells them to parrot. So how can I make sure that my sellers are actually learning so that when they're in a live conversation and don't have the AI agent at their disposal, that they're actually going to show up well, that they're actually going to be a consultant for their customers? How can we make sure that we don't lose the actual knowledge in that process that's AI assisted? Yeah. yeah. Question of the day, right? Like I'm sort of a, a true AI believer where I'm like, hey, there are parts of that that maybe a sales team won't do in five or seven years. So I'm fine losing some of, of that. Yeah, this rep doesn't know every account backwards and forwards, but the API inside your CRM does, right? <laughs> I'm fine with that. But I think you know, if I was going to try to respond specifically, first of all, there's probably a case to be made around like the manual to scale loop. Do the first 10 yourself yeah. so that you can actually implement a framework for the next 100 that's based on your real process and how you would understand it. And then there's sort of like a feedback loop. So I'd say to be fair, 
you probably should do a bunch of that work yourself to figure out what to scale and to figure out what you need to know and things like that. But I would argue that if you get to the end of these 100 accounts, wave a magic wand, everything's sort of figured out of what to talk about, value props, positioning, et cetera, you're actually going to learn a lot more by executing across 50 or 100 accounts instead of five to 10. And that's where the real learning, like what lands? What do the customers say? What are the objections that come up? So you're sort of like compressing the prep time and providing a lot more time on execution and customer engagement. That's where the real learning happens anyway. Like it is true that you want to have your brain sort of like have the muscle memory around how to do the thing. Yeah. But you're just, it's a means to an end. You're just trying to get the right information to the customer and have this, you know, authentic engagement that gets you to the right place. That's the important part. So I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of make work in go to market. Yeah. Right. I was super busy this week. Busy internally or externally? If you're in sales, you want to be busy externally. That's all yeah. of it. That that's really well said, Ben. I, I happen to agree. And just because you have an AI created account plan, it doesn't mean you show up to the meeting unprepared. It means that you save yourself the two hours of research so you can spend 30 minutes really thinking deeply about the information in the account plan. Prep yep. for the meeting. Create yep. something that's bespoke for that person so that that engagement is really effective. Because right now. To your point, like reps, I think the, the latest stats that I see, and you'll see figures all over the place, but the consensus seems to be about only a third of reps' time is spent selling. The other right. two thirds of the, their time is spent running in quicksand. So what are we doing here? They're super Gathering slow data, down. processing data, like all the stuff that AI is really good at. 100%. If I could share my screen, I want to show one example yeah, please. of this. Awesome. So this is, this is a file that we prepare for a set of accounts, right? It has all the sort of core attributes that you might think of as, you know, and this is going to be a very Zoom info centric example, but there's a lot, like every company has a version of this is my, is my premise. So employee counts, SIC codes, industries, subsidiaries, you know, all the normal stuff, addresses, who owns this company. Great. You should do all that. Then you have all the things like persona density. What's the relative mix of people at this mm -hmm. account? How do I think about the way the company's set up, may inform the way that they, they operate. And then I'm going and looking at what do we integrate with at this company, right? Like, which of the technologies that this company owns directly integrate with ZoomInfo? For our case, everyone has a version of this. And then you've got which scoops and which new signals are happening. What are all the things that are going on in that account? It tells you a lot about the yield for any given set of, of plays. I'm setting all that up because out here at the end, what we've done is we've also gone and on a row-by-row -row basis, automatically picked the relevant tech categories to even look the relevant scoops categories of which new signals they might care about, which persona functions we should think about tracking for this particular company. What are the relevant intent topics, right? So I'm doing this for this entire account set in one go with a call to, to AI. You could make the case that a rep digging through our list of 5,000 intent topics or you know, 42,000 tech co topics that they're going to learn a lot. But really, they're going to spin their wheels and probably get to a crap answer in the right. end. This is basically allowing the stand on the shoulders of that work and be like, hey, I've already thought through what, you know, for you is going to be a thing. You're just going to have a way better conversation about what is the implication of knowing all this to inform your go-to-market strategy or whatever. Yeah. Instead of, oh, I earned my stripes learning about this account, it's just fast. Let's get to the good part, right? Get to the, the real part of the conversation. So again, a very Zoom Info-centric example. But every company has an example of looking at data about their customers, combining it with information about what you sell and what you care about, and, and sort of like shortcutting that. So then again, you're just like getting a lot more leverage. That, that leverage is a great word, Ben. The, the thing that we think a lot about is how can we give teams real go-to-market velocity? How can yeah. we give them speed and the right direction and go have them run at the right things at the right time with, with actual results. And that's what AI unlocks is that leverage points, the true velocity for orgs that right now is completely missing across so many teams for so many reasons. So we are already out of time. I can't believe it. Where can people go, Ben, to learn more about you, learn more about Zoom Info, learn more about ZI Labs? Yeah, LinkedIn, obviously a good place to connect. I'm on Twitter and everywhere else too. Zoominfo.com slash labs has a bunch of information about stuff that we're doing for, for companies, but I'm putting out a lot of content, you know, be in the comments, tell me where I'm wrong and, you know, engage with us online. We also do a lot of events and stuff, but 
I just want to say I'm thrilled with what you all are building at, at copy.ai and we should we should do more of this. This is the first of many, my friend. Love it. Thanks a lot for having me on, Kyle. It's been a pleasure, Ben. Thank you so much.